So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nancy Yip from the Hong Kong University of Science and Te Technology. Her talk is Understanding the Roles of Interleukin-33 in Alzheimer's Disease, New Therapeutic Insights. Welcome, Dr. Nancy Yip. Thank you, Jackie. I want to uh, first thank uh, Li Hui and the organizers for inviting me uh, to this uh, exciting symposium. So you can see the slides, right? Yeah, so uh, for this talk, I want to share with you uh, our recent findings for uh, understanding the uh, regulation and the roles of interleukin-33 uh, DCAR receptor uh, solubacity 2 in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, Alzheimer's disease is a complex disease. Uh, as A-beta uh, accumulates, microglia are activated to phagocytose and clear A-beta. As A-beta continues to accumulate, uh, it can result in a dysfunction of microglia, uh, chronic uh, neuroinflammation, uh, leading to deficits in synaptic remodeling and neurodegeneration. Now, there are different cell types that contribute to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, including neurons, uh, microglia, astrocytes, endothelial cells. So, it is important for us to um, identify molecular and cellular mechanisms that can contribute to uh, the AD pathogenesis. So I want to uh, discuss our work on uh, a cytokine called interleukin-33, IL-33. It is a member of the IL-1 receptor family, and it acts as an alignment to maintain uh, immune homeostasis. IL-33 uh, binds to a heterodimeric receptor complex, ST2 and IL-1 receptor accessory protein. Now, uh, ST2 exists in addition to the uh, membrane-bound form. Uh, there's also a soluble form of uh, ST2, and it can act as an endogenous IL-33 inhibitor because um, Soluble SD2 uh, is a decor receptor that can inhibit the uh, function of IL-33. When we look at the level of soluble SD2 in the plasma of uh, AD patients compared to healthy control, we found that uh, there's elevated level of uh, soluble SD2 in the uh, plasma of AD patients. Importantly, we also uh, found that the uh, level of soluble SD2 in the cerebrospinal fluid of AD patients is uh, elevated compared to that of the healthy control. We also uh, look at the um, uh, A beta plaque load in those uh, individuals, and we found that um, it actually uh, positively correlates with the level of soluble ST2. That is, the high the level of soluble ST2, the high is the A beta plaque load. Now, in order to understand uh, the functional consequence of high level of soluble ST2, we uh, injected um, soluble ST2 using I ICV into these um, AD transgenic mouse model. And we found that the injection uh, of soluble ST2 to those mice actually resulted in um, uh, increase in the A beta plaque load, as shown here. So with soluble uh, ST2 uh, injected ICV, there's an increase in the A beta plaque load in those mice. We also wanted to see if um, this particular uh, uh, injection of soluble SD2 can affect the ability of microglia to undergo A beta phagocytosis. So, what I show here is that um, we first uh, label A beta using uh, Mifoxy XO4, and then we look at um, 
the microglia with uh, A beta uptake. You can see in this quantitation that uh, soluble SG2 injection actually uh, can uh, reduce the number of microglia with uh, A beta uptake. So elevated level of soluble SG2 can play a role in AD pathogenesis. Can we manipulate IL-33 SG2 signaling uh, to regulate A-beta pathology? And if so, what is the underlying uh, mechanism? So we inject uh, the cytokine uh, IL-33 uh, to those mice, and then we found that actually injection of IL-33 after just two days, it can reduce the um, uh, A-beta deposition as shown here. We also found that IL-33 can alleviate the memory dysfunction and rescue uh, hippocampal synaptic uh, dysfunction. So injection of IL-33 uh, can result in those uh, rescue of uh, the uh, deficits that are characteristic of those mice. So what is the mechanism uh, un that underlie the, uh, the uh, beneficial effect of IL-33? So we look at the ability of IL-33 to influence the recruitment of microglia to A-beta. As I shown you earlier, microglia uh, can clear A-beta through phagocytosis. So what I show here is uh, without or with IL-33 injection, and IBA1 labels the microglia. So after IL-33 injection, the, uh, the A-beta plaque is smaller. And we also noted that um, there, the proximity between the microglia and the, uh, the A-beta is uh, reduced. So after the 3D reconstruction of these images, you can see here that uh, IL-33 injection can increase the colocalization of A beta with microglia. Then we want to look at the uh, phenotypic changes of the microglia uh, before or after IL-33. So we generated the APP PS1 63 CR1 EFP mice to label the microglia. And then we use two photon in vivo imaging to visualize the phenotypic changes of the microglia. So here, microglia is labeled in green and A beta in red. So under the uh, control conditions, the microglia are relatively stationary and uh, without too much movement. But then after IL-33 treatment, what we observed is that the microglia start to migrate towards the plaque that is labeled in red. So we monitor the migration of the microglia towards the plaque. And here is the, um, the images, the, here are the images that we obtain. So uh, after 12 hours, you can see that IL-33 can induce the uh, migration of the microglia towards the plaque. And we quantitate the, um, the percentage of the microglia with high mobility. You can see in this, um, in this diagram that uh, there is a significant increase uh, in the percentage of microglia with high mobility after IL-33 uh, injection. So what will be the consequence uh, if the microglia are migrating uh, more towards uh, the plaque? So again, we use facts analysis and we look at the resident microglia that are labeled uh, by uh, CD11B plus and also low expression of CD45. And we found that IL-33 can increase the percentage of microglial cell with A-beta uptake. So when IL-33 increased the migration of microglia towards A-beta, it can increase the proportion of A-beta phagocytic microglia. So in order to further understand uh, which microglial subpopulation undergo uh, this kind of changes, we know that 
uh, single cell RNA sequencing analysis or microglia from the transgenic mouse model reveal that the uh, microglia will transit from homeostatic state to um, the uh, DC state. So, uh, and this is uh, correlated with the changes in the uh, genetic uh, profiling. So there's an increase in the disease associated microglia signature. And in parallel, there's a reduction in a homeostatic signature in terms of the uh, transcriptome. So we perform single cell RNA sequencing profile uh, analysis for the three conditions, uh, control with the wild type, APPPS1, without or with IL-33 injection. We noted that uh, based on the TSNE clustering, uh, the, uh, the, um, the microglia actually the, is quite similar. So as shown in this quantitation here, the uh, microglia proportion uh, for the DAM population is about the same uh, without or with IL-33 injection. So this shows that the uh, beneficial effect of IL-33 is not because of the changes in the DAM uh, microglial population. And then we uh, found that actually in terms of the microglial transcriptome profile, there is a significant uh, change. And as you can visualize in this heat map uh, data, the changes are reflected in the MHC2 uh, genes. In parallel, IL-33 can also rescue uh, the reduction in terms of the uh, homeosignature gene, homeostatic signature genes. So with this population of IL-33 uh, responsive microglia uh, have uh, increased uh, phagocytic ability. And indeed, that was what we uh, observed. So when we uh, quantitate um, the ability of this population of microglial cells that respond to IL-33 uh, as marked by the MHC2, we found that this sub subpopulation of microglial cells, they exhibit an increase in ability to uptake, to uptake uh, A beta. Again, this is based on the facts analysis with methoxy XO4 to label the A beta and MHC2 to uh, be the marker for the microglial responsive uh, cell types. And then we uh, perform a, a temporal uh, analysis to look at the phenotypic changes of the microglia following uh, IL-33 treatment in the APPPS1 mice at three time point. So, at three hours, the microglia start to migrate towards a beta plaque, as uh, uh, I showed you earlier, based on the live imaging. And at eight hours again, uh, they continue to migrate. At 24 hours, they phagocytose uh, a beta based on the uh, flow uh, cytometry analysis. So we perform bulk RNA seq and single cell RNA seq. And the data uh, shows that IL-33 stimulates a stepwise transcriptome reprogramming in the microglia. Pathway analysis uh, show that um, at three hours, there's increase in the uh, uh, stress response, uh, including cell activation, uh, response to stress, et cetera. Now, some of these genes remain elevated, and these include the, the genes associated uh, with chemotaxis. So uh, IL-33, uh, based on our analysis, it triggers a stepwise transcriptome reprogramming in microglia in AD. So um, the data shows that uh, it undergoes a stepwise transcriptomic uh, reprogramming. And these uh, correlates with the induction of the chemotactic uh, uh, subpopulation of microglia and, uh, and then followed by the uh, phagocytic uh, uh, state transition 
So IL-33 triggers this uh, transcriptome reprogramming that is associated with the phenotypic changes in terms of the microglial state transition. So I just want to uh, recap what I uh, uh, show uh, so far. So with IL-33, there is the state transition from homeostatic state to chemotactic state, and then ultimately phagocytic state, which result in A-beta clearance. Is the induction of the chemotactic state necessary for the subsequent phagocytic state? So we first uh, perform bulk RNA sequencing analysis, analysis uh, comparing the, uh, the wild type and, and those um, with SD2 knockout. And we uh, performed this by uh, crossbreeding the APPPS1 mice with the uh, SD2 knockout mice. We identify 529 differentially expressed genes. And we found that out of these, 72 are actually uh, signature genes of chemotactic microglia. And so with the uh, knockdown or knockout of ST2, uh, these genes are um, totally uh, abolished. So as shown here, when we look at whether uh, ST2 genetic ablation can affect the proportion of chemotactic microglia that is induced by IL-33, you can see clearly that while this um, is increased with IL-33 treatment in the wild type, uh, in the ST2 uh, knockout mice, it is uh, totally uh, abolished. Furthermore, what we found is that the uh, genetic ablation of ST2 can also abolish the induction of phagocytic microglia uh, uh, by IL-33 uh, as shown in this uh, quantitation. So once again, uh, in the APPPS1 mice, uh, IL-33 can induce the, uh, the proportion of MXC2 microglia. And uh, then if you knock out ST2, this uh, phagocytic microglia that is induced by IL-33 is totally abolished. Uh, I don't have data to, uh, to show, I don't have time to show you this data, but we also identify that the uh, transcription factor P1 is responsible for this ability of uh, IL-33 to phagocytose and induce uh, A-beta clearance. So my lab is also interested to understand how the genetic factors can contribute to the dysregulation of SOLOST2 and AD risk and whether solo ST2 can contribute to, to the pathogenesis of AD. Now, uh, we perform a whole genome analysis followed by GWAS, and we were able to identify that the uh, level of soluble ST2 is actually associated uh, with um, this particular locus, IL-1 receptor L1, which encodes both the uh, the fooling form and also the soluble ST2 form. And we identified uh, this particular uh, locus and in addition, a genetic variant uh, that can affect the uh, level of class of the soluble ST2 in the plasma. So for individuals that carry this particular genetic variant, there is a reduction in the level of soluble ST2 in the plasma. We further uh, identify the, uh, the cell type uh, that uh, express the soluble ST2 gene. And we found that it is the endothelial cells as shown uh, in, this, uh, in this diagram here. So uh, the uh, genetic variant that we identify, RS1921622, uh, as shown here is associated with decreased uh, soluble ST2 expression. We further perform um, 
experiments to show that if we delete uh, the uh, the locus that is associated with uh, solo ST2 expression, we found that uh, this manipulation can reduce the uh, soluble uh, SD2 transcript level. So this particular uh, uh, genetic variant that we identify is a key genetic factor that can regulate the soluble ST2 level. So what, what would be the consequence for individuals that carry this particular allele? We actually perform uh, analysis uh, with multiple cohorts, including uh, the Chinese cohort and also uh, cohorts uh, with, um, of uh, European descent. And we found that individuals um, that carry this particular uh, allele, they show reduction in the uh, AD risk. And the reduction is by approximately 20 to 40%. And it's mainly observed in the female APOE4 carriers. Now for these uh, female APOE4 carriers, if there's an increase in the soluble SC2 level, they exhibit increased uh, AD risk. So this particular variant that we identify seem to be a protective uh, variant. We perform analysis, again, uh, comparing uh, carriers of this variant or the non-carriers of this variant. We found that um, carriers of this particular variant, two copies, it can uh, result in a delay in the onset uh, of AD. Uh, and the other observation that we, that we made is that there is an increase in the brain region volume, for example, in the entorhinal cortex. We perform an other, another analysis uh, with an Australian cohort, and we found that for the individuals that carry that carries two copies of this particular variant, there is an increase uh, in, uh, in the um, gray matter volume, that is, it protects against the atrophy of gray matter in the brains of these individuals when compared to those individuals that do not uh, carry the particular variant. So this is based on, on the longitudinal studies over a period of 7.5 years. So we want to understand the functional roles of this particular variant in the pathogenesis of AD. So we examined the effect on the molecular and cellular phenotypes of individual cell types. So what you can uh, observe in this particular uh, data set is that for individuals that carry, that are carriers of this particular variant, we see an increase in the uh, activation genes of the microglia. And concomitantly, there's a reduction in the homeostatic genes. So this particular variant is associated with increased microglial activation. Now, the, uh, in those individuals that carry this variant, we also observe that there is an increase uh, microglia plaque activation, as you can observe in this, uh, in this photograph. So again, comparing those that uh, carry uh, one copy of this uh, genetic variant versus the non-carrier, there's a clear increase in the uh, co-localization of microglia with the A-beta plaque. It is also associated with a reduction in the A-beta deposition as shown in the quantitation here. So again, this is comparing non-carrier with uh, carriers, one copy or two copies. And we were able to observe significant reduction in the A-beta plaque load uh, in the carrier. So,
what I want to uh, summarize is that um, solar vst 2 uh, from the periphery, they can uh, block the normal uh, action of IL-33, which is through uh, act acting on the uh, normal uh, heterodimeric complex for IL-33, it can uh, enhance the migration of microglia towards the plaque and then uh, uh, affect the uh, abasal phagocytosis and clearance. But in the presence of the soluble uh, ST2, this normal function of IL-33 is blocked and hence it results in an increase in A-beta deposition. So we identify this particular genetic variant uh, that can lower the expression of solar ST2 and it can protect against the AD risk. So this reveals an, a new therapeutic uh, potential, which is if we can find a way to somehow suppress solar ST2, then the funding agencies that support my work, both from Hong Kong and also from uh, mainland China. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yip, for a wonderful talk. It's really great, like how you connected the phenotypes with the genetics and also with the different uh, microglia transcriptomic states. It's it's really wonderful. Uh, I see Tracy already has a question, so uh, we'll give the we'll give Tracy that the was, chance. That was that was a that was beautiful a beautiful talk, and I, I I noticed you noticed I noticed that you you showed beautifully this interaction. Um, of your new SNP with APOE4 genotype, but given the molecular interactions with IL-33 and with PU.1, I was wondering if you looked for genetic associations between variants at those loci um, with this risk variant. Uh, we have not done that, and that, that is something that we would love to do, uh, to have a better understanding of the uh, underlying mechanism. I think identifying this particular genetic variant actually uh, give us a lot of insight, um, you know, how this variant can actually uh, impact, for example, the, the outcome of APOE4. And we believe that, uh, you know, if we can find a way to, to understand how these pathways converge, we might have a better handle uh, on coming up with, uh, you know, new therapeutic approach that, that might be applicable, uh, particularly for those individuals, you know, the female APOE4 carriers, you know, maybe, you know, it is necessary to, to, uh, to do patient stratification and maybe, you know, a uh, certain therapeutic approach uh, will be more beneficial for, for certain, uh, you know, uh, patient uh, population. And, and, and that's why I think doing this kind of genetic analysis is extremely revealing because we'll be able to understand, uh, you know, how to go about designing the therapeutic approach and, and not just, you know, go with a very uh, unified approach, I would say. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Yep, uh, we'll do the second question from the audience, which is also a question I'm super interested in. Uh, it's from Mariana Garcia Coro. Can you elaborate on the gender differences that you found regarding the effects of uh, soluble ST2 on AD risk? Yeah, so uh, we actually um, pawned over it for, you know, for a while because we, um, we were able to really uh, uh, identify this effect if we you know, stratify the, uh, the patient population. And we uh, found that it is most significant for the female uh, APOE4 carrier. So the, the the gender issue, I think part of it is because um, the regulation of IL-33 uh, SD2 signaling, uh, uh, the regulation is quite different uh, between uh, genders. So it might have an impact uh, at that particular level. So sex hormones can regulate uh, IL-33 uh, 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 signaling pathway. So uh, we think that that, that might be you know, uh, one approach that we can take in order to understand why the effect uh, is particularly significant in the female uh, group. Another um, another point that, that we are thinking is that 
the increase in solo ST2 is actually higher for females during AD progression. So, uh, so that might also have have uh, you know another uh, impact. Uh, so we're we're looking at both and, and see uh, you know which ones or maybe both of them actually account uh, for this uh, gender difference. Yeah. It's a very good question. We we are you know very interested to to understand more. Thank you. And we have another question from one of our speakers, uh, Gilbert Di Paolo. Paolo. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, great talk, Nancy. Um, great to see some uh, genetic signal in this um, this pathway. But I had a more uh, general question about uh, IL-1 cytokines. It, we, of course, we know from uh, the work of uh, the late Ben Barris, Shane Lindelow, that IL-1 alpha is 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 bad. Uh, from the work of Michael Henneke that IL-1 beta is, is bad in the context of AD models. So the question is, do you, do you have evidence that the stimulation of that uh, receptor by uh, IL-33 uh, kind of trans-represses the signaling of IL-1 beta or IL-1 alpha um, to sort of avoid uh, the pro-inflammatory uh, responses through IL-1 receptor? Yeah, we actually have not looked at that in detail, you know, whether it can um, uh, have that effect. But based on all our studies uh, using the, the mouse model, uh, we actually see uh, uh, suppression of pro-inflammatory uh, uh, pathway. So, so it, it, it seems that IL-33 is quite special in that sense, uh, you know, unlike the, uh, the other related cytokines. So, but we would love to Look at the uh, the mechanistic level in more detail and and see if we can dissect it out more. But so far, it seems to be a uh, beneficial effect if it is delivered, you know, uh, to the CNS. And in the periphery, is a different story, right? In the periphery, it may not be it may not be so uh, desirable. So um, yeah, so th that's something that we definitely uh, want to study more. So and and that's also why. Uh, we we are keen to to try and manipulate the pathway uh, that is mediated by IL thirty three and not just using IL thirty yeah. three because because of potential uh, you know side effects. So and and I do believe that if we can somehow manipulate the level of solid waste T two, that might be a a better approach uh, compared to the cytokine. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Um, and I think we, we still have time for one or two more questions. There's another question from the audience from Elaine O. Laughlin. Uh, so the question is, is this SNP associated with other inflammatory disorders, for example, asthma or lung disorders? Um, so there is L33 antibody for asthma from Sanofi, for example. Um, so I wonder, uh, Dr. Yip, if you could comment on that. <laughs> we have not actually looked at the association of this particular variant uh, related to other disorders. So we, we did the uh, association study uh, mainly uh, for the uh, AD patients. But uh, of course, you know, given the role of um, R33 signaling in other conditions, I think that kind of study, you know, should be should be. Uh, perform, yeah. So, so far analysis is, is really based uh, on the uh, on the AT cohort. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think we could still get one last question. Uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Shane Lidlow uh, also has a question. Yeah, thanks for that, Jackie. And thank you, Nancy. This is really, really exciting. Uh, I, I love it when you're sort of looking at uh, mutations and looking at what their functional output is. And one of the things that I'm always intrigued by is do you, have you tried to track this developmentally? And I'm sorry if I missed this throughout your presentation, but do you think that the, the change in function, uh, and like Gilbert brought up the sort of uh, difference between different interleukins, do you think that that could be causing different effects early in development, in the early progression of disease or in later stages of disease? Yeah, I think, again, a great question. Uh, for our studies, we mainly focused uh, on the adult stage, and we did not did not look at uh, you know um, the effect during development. But I think it would be a wonderful 
area to to look into. Yeah, so all our studies are are really uh, using adult uh, mouse models. Yeah, that's that's. Oh, I, I, I understand I why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm yeah. just always taken if we're all collectively and we think about this a lot. If we're missing some interesting biology that is setting yeah. the brain up for dysfunction later. Um, yeah. I don't know how we're going to go back and do all of our studies again developmentally, but it's something we think about a lot. So this is a very cool model. I like it a lot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope some labs will do it. Definitely. <laughs>